Welcome to Second Ponstelian Baptist Church. It is good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Uh, here we gather each week uh, as a community of faith uh, to worship God. And as always, I'm excited about God, what God is going to do among us in the coming hour. Uh, let us be mindful as we enter into worship of God's presence in this place um, that we might approach worship uh, with reverence and humility together. Uh, for those of you who are visiting us for the first time, uh, my name is Timothy Boone. Um, I'm the young adult minister here at Second Ponce, um, and I would love a chance to meet you after the service. Uh, so would our other ministers. Um, so we would ask you to make yourself known, uh, first by uh, filling out a visitor's card, worshiping with us, um, and finally, uh, please know that you are welcome uh, in this place. So let's continue our worship together now in prayer. God of every good and perfect gift, we come to you today seeking many things, peace, love, comfort, healing, O oh God. We come to you hungry, Lord, hungry for your word, hungry for a new way of living. We trust that you will give us food for our deepest hunger. We come to you now, bread of life. Satisfy us with your unfailing love. Amen. here today to present a portion of our musical, The Light Before Christmas, and to invite you to come and see it in its entirety on Wednesday, December 13th, right here in the sanctuary at 6.15 p.m. Since you're only going to see a small bit of the show, we wanted to give you a little background. Here you see a group of students at a Christian school preparing for a Christmas party. I'm Mr. Cutler, their teacher, and I'm hoping somewhere along the way they'll learn the real meaning of Christmas. Okay, so we have the light of creation. We have the light that the shepherds saw. So is this the story of Christmas or the story of light? Well, technically, I suppose you could say it's both. 
Because, well, you could even say that Christmas is the story of light. As in the lights on the tree? Well, not exactly. Duh! He's talking about the light from the star! Any star in particular? The star that led the three wise men to see the baby Jesus. When you consider that light travels 186,000 miles per second, the star you're referring to could be billions of years old. Translation? The star could have been in place since the beginning of time. So, what you're saying is that God knew from the beginning of time that he would send his son to Earth? Absolutely! So God used the, used the light to announce the news to the shepherds, and he used the light to lead the wise men to where the baby Jesus was, and when they got there, they saw a tree with lights on it, and that's why we're having a party? <sighs> That would be completely unfeasible, considering it wasn't until 1882 that the first Christmas tree was lit by electricity. Before then, people would take, a, take melted wax and glue candles to tree branches. Where do you learn all this, and why do you feel like you have to share it with us? I think I'm starting to get it. Christmas really is the story of light. Yes, Savannah, it is. But we still haven't answered the most important question. Which is, when does the party finally start? No! What's the true light of Christmas? That's the question I'm talking about.
we can definitely see Christ light through these wonderful, hardworking, Christ-filled children. Thank you all so much for that preview. Looking forward to that Wednesday night. Christ is the world's light, Christ and none other. Give God the glory, God and none other. Spirit, Son, and Father. Hymn number 154.
We come now to time for prayer. And so let us turn our hearts and minds to God and pray together. Loving God, we are ever grateful for your love for us, for your patience and trust. This day, we are thankful for the joys of this community. We pray that you would continue to be with us in our happiness and weariness, our celebrations and our struggles. O oh God, hear our prayer. We pray for our world that faces so much violence. We pray especially for the people suffering from war. May leaders at every level learn to speak in favor of humanity and justice. We pray that all people can walk the path of peace, the path of forgiveness, the path of equality. O oh God, hear our prayer. On this weekend and this day, we give thanks for the men and women who have served our nation, people who have given themselves for a cause greater than themselves, people who have risked their lives for someone else, people who have acknowledged that there are things in this world worth dying for and that one of those things is the person beside them. We pray especially for veterans home recently from war who have sacrificed much, many of whom struggle to handle strong emotions or who struggle to retain broken bodies. O oh God, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who suffer in our community and throughout the world for those who find themselves in the wake of disaster, of tragedy or destruction, enfold them in your loving arms. We remember all those who face persecution and discrimination. We ask for your spirit of reconciliation to be near. May we learn the call to be bearers of peace and spread this vision through love and solidarity. Teach us the power of love and forgiveness, that our words may be ones of healing and hope. O oh God, hear our prayer. Lord, we ask that you would nurture within us a sense of loyalty, honor, and duty that you would call us beyond our selfishness so that we would be also willing to put someone else's needs above our own. That you would help us to see that our calling to follow you is not to be taken lightly and that we cannot simply cast aside for convenience sake the duty of a Christian to forgive, to love, and to be honest. O oh God, hear our prayer. In silence now, we offer concerns and prayers of our hearts, knowing you are always there to listen, even when we may not have the words. O oh God, hear our prayers, and in your love, answer. We pray all this in the name of your Son, the one who offers hope, justice, peace, and freedom to all. Amen.
Now thank we all our God. Is your heart thankful this morning? I'm glad someone said yes. Thank you. I'm thankful for children and youth who a few moments ago pointed us to the true light of the world through their story and song. And I look forward to seeing the whole thing in December. Thank you, children. I'm thankful on this weekend for veterans who have served our country with bravery, courage, sacrifice. I'm grateful for your service. I'm thankful for Susan Messer, who's given service in leading us in worship this morning. I'm thankful to God for the gift of life, especially this week, the gift of life named Samuel Rotz. You see, the reason Steve is not up here is Steve and Joy and their family have welcomed Samuel Rotz, and we are grateful that Susan can be here, that they are at home welcoming this gift into their family. Those are a few things for which I am thankful. What about you? If you take an inventory in your own heart and in your own life, on this weekend when we offer recognition and gratitude as a country, as we peer around the corner and Thanksgiving is just a few days away, maybe Today is a good day to talk about thanks, giving thanks, and how we give thanks. I would like to read a brief passage of Scripture, the Word of God for the people of God as we think about thanks. But as soon as I read these words, in my mind, some questions arise. Maybe they do for you. So let's hear God's instructions to us, and then let's ponder the questions and seek God's answers. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. He served as a pastor during one of history's most devastating wars, the Thirty Years' War in Europe from 1618 to 1648. Martin Rinkert was a pastor in Eilenburg, Germany. And during that time, because of the war and because of disease, death was all around. Suffering was profound. In fact, in 1637, Martin Rinkert, as pastor in this community of Eilenburg, he was responsible for leading 4,500 funerals. I can't even imagine that. And yet he did. But even with all of that suffering, with tears that were abounding everywhere, with struggle that people faced, Martin Rinkert is best known for a little table grace that he wrote for children. It goes like this. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things hath done, in whom the world rejoices. Does that sound familiar? I hope so. In the midst of a time of tremendous tears, Martin Rinkert was able to write these beautiful words about thanks. Tears and thanks. How in the world do they go together? That well-known hymn took a personal turn for me five years ago. My mother was dying. For about a week, she was lying in her bed, unresponsive, 
Our family gathered around her, never knowing if she could hear or not, but assuming she could, we would talk and pray and visit. And then my sister Susan thought, why don't we sing around her bed? I wasn't too sure about that, but Susan encouraged me and we went down the hall to Dad's study and got a hymnal and just began moving through the hymnal as we sang around Mom's bed. And then my sister landed on, now thank we all our God, and said, this would be a great one. Why don't we sing it? And I began singing it and literally did not make it through the first verse before tears were pouring down my face and I was choking the words out. You see, I'd never really paid a whole lot of attention to that whole first verse. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices who wondrous things hath done in whom his world rejoices. I was fine on that part. It's the next part that got me. Who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today and as i was lying there being thankful for the life of my mother my thanksgiving was filtered through my own tears how do tears and thanks go together One of my favorite writers is Wendell Berry. He's written a beautiful book about tears and thanks. It's a novel called Hannah Coulter. It's written from the perspective of a senior adult woman who is looking back on her life. This woman had twice become a widow during her life. She had known great grief and much joy and all kind of pearls of wisdom come from her as she looks back. She says at one point, I was grateful because I knew even in my fear and grief that my life had been filled with gifts. Even in my grief, there were gifts. And then out of her wisdom, she said this, you mustn't wish for another life. You mustn't want to be somebody else. What you must do is this. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. I'm not all the way capable of so much, but those are the right instructions she was absolutely right I, I'm not so capable of giving thanks in all things and rejoicing always but those are the right instructions so how do we do that how do we give thanks in all circumstances even when those circumstances are when tears are in our eyes and the answer, of course, is Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Philippians in that second chapter, he said, Have this mind in you which was in Christ Jesus, challenging us to have this mind of Christ, this way of thinking that Jesus used. And so I got a little curious. Well, how did Jesus give thanks? If we take the Bible and open it up, and look through all four Gospels, we will find four occasions where Jesus gave thanks. Now, I'm sure he did more than that, but these were the recorded times, four different occasions. And as I read each one of those, it's amazing. Jesus could have just as easily shed tears. Every time he gave thanks, there was a tremendous challenge. There was a burden laid upon him. There was something troubling him. He didn't wait for life to be all rosy and glorious to give thanks. Every one of these examples were from times when life was hard. 
So let's look at those. Let's see what we might learn from the way that Jesus gave thanks, and perhaps, perhaps that will teach us how we can give thanks in all circumstances. For you see, you may be one who's come today, and this is one of those tear seasons in your life. It's a time of struggle, the time of pain. In fact, you may be wondering, how am I going to make it through Thanksgiving and Christmas as everybody's trying to be so happy and joyful and thankful and you're hurting? Let's learn from Jesus. And maybe what we learn will help us as we face tomorrow. First thing, give thanks for simple gifts. Give thanks for simple gifts. John 6, verse 11 says this, Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. You know the story, don't you? It's the only miracle that Jesus performed, which is in all four Gospels the feeding of the 5,000. So Jesus had been preaching, and there were 5,000 people there. It was lunchtime. There was no fast food around. How in the world are we going to feed this crowd? Everyone was hungry, (laughs) but they didn't find any answers for food. So as a, a kind of a test, Jesus said to Philip, how are we going to feed this crowd? Philip shrugged. Andrew was the one who went out and found a boy who had a little lunch, and he brought this lunch, a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. But even Andrew, as he was bringing this lunch, said, what is this among so many? In other words, he gave the lunch, but it seemed so small, so insignificant, so simple when the crowd was so big and so hungry. And what did Jesus do with it? He took that, that small, simple little boy's lunch, and he gave thanks. It's a wonderful way to look at life. You see, we can always look at life through a scarcity mentality. We can look at life and find everything that we don't have and we wish we had and bemoan the fact we don't have it. You know people like this, don't you? Or we can live life from an abundance mentality. That's what Jesus was doing. The abundance was not just because the the little boy's lunch was so big. It wasn't. The abundance was because it was a gift. It was grace. It had come. And Jesus took it and gave thanks for it. And as he gave thanks for that simple gift, as he gave thanks, then the multiplication began to happen. The miracle happened, and everyone was fed, and baskets were left over. But I think he was teaching all of us that in every corner of our life, we will always have opportunities to look at life through a scarcity mentality and think of things we don't have and be critical of life or situations or whatever it is, or we can focus on the very small gifts and say thank you. And when we do that, even if those small gifts seem so insignificant in the face of our challenges, if we do that, then God continues that miracle that miracle of multiplication in our own lives where the grace of something small overflows to abundance. So what would that look like in your life if you gave thanks for simple gifts? What would it look like if instead of focusing on what you don't have and being critical, what if you looked at what you do have and being thankful? first lesson from the way Jesus gave thanks. But he teaches us more. 
I think Jesus would say to us, give thanks for the mystery of life. Matthew 11, verse 25. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Now, this one is a little harder to understand, isn't it? Literally, Jesus is thanking God for something that was hidden, that was mysterious, that was not fully clear. We tend to always want something to be clear and understandable, and yet Jesus was saying, I'm glad that the wise folks, the old folks, they don't get this, and the infants do. He was being thankful even for the mystery of life. We go back to verse 20 just earlier and see that Jesus had been preaching. He had been preaching about repentance, and yet people were not responding. And so he had been rebuking those who had not responded to his preaching. And then he said this, and it makes me wonder, how in the world are we thankful for the mystery? You see, there's so many mysteries I wish I understood the hard questions of life. I wish I understood why there was cancer, and I wish there wasn't cancer. I wish I understood about natural disasters and why they seemed to come. I wish I wasn't such a mystery about all this in violence, in schools, in churches, cities. There's a whole lot of mystery in life right now that I certainly don't understand, and yet Jesus it seems to be saying, thank you, God, that there's some mystery and that the wise folks don't understand everything. Why would he say that? Well, I read from Matthew 11, verse 25. Just after that, in verse 28, just when he had finished this thought, the very next thing, it's a famous verse, come to me, all you who are weary, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and come and learn from me. Think about a little child, a little child who doesn't understand the mystery of a thunderstorm, doesn't understand what makes the, the skies rumble so loud and the lightning, and it's a scary thing, and so that mystery is not understood by a child, but it might cause the child to crawl up in mommy or daddy's lap and hug tightly. The mystery doesn't go away, but out of the mystery comes a closeness that might have never happened. Do you see? And so maybe Jesus was saying, Father, I'm thankful that that." People may not understand everything I'm saying. I'm thankful that there's some mystery to life. I'm thankful that it's sometimes hard to understand so that everyone will come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, all who are burdened by mysteries they can't understand, all who are wrestling with the uncertainties of life. Come and crawl up in my lap, and I will give you rest. The mysteries don't go away. I don't care how much you believe, how much you understand the Bible, there's still some mystery there. The question is, are we coming to Christ and allowing the mystery to draw us closer to the heart of God? And When that happens, we can be thankful. Thankful for the one who says, come unto me, even when you don't understand. Give thanks for the God who hears. John chapter 11, verse 41. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, 
so that they may believe that you sent me. John 11, that's Lazarus, the friend of Jesus who had died. In fact, in that same chapter, we, we see the simple words. It's the verse I always love to memorize because it only has two words, Jesus wept. And Jesus did weep. He, he offered up tears, pained by the death of his friend, but even in those tears, he calls out to God, and he says, I thank you, God. And what was he saying? I thank you for having heard me. In fact, he says, I know you always hear me, but I'm saying this so that those around me will know that you hear me. We focus a lot on, do we hear God? Do we hear the voice of God? Do we know the, the will of God? We focus a lot about hearing God, but have you ever given thanks that God hears you? That's what Jesus was doing. In the midst of this time of his own tearfulness, he was saying, Lord, I thank you that you're listening. What a gift. It seems that every other commercial on television these days is a, for a cell phone company, you know? And as they're battling it out in all those commercials, there's the battles of the apps and the maps, and we learned about drop calls and there was that saying from some years ago, can you hear me now? And even that guy's changed cell phone companies now, <laughs> you know? Can you hear me now? And that's the call of all of us, Lord, can you hear me now? And God is saying yes. And Jesus is being thankful, Lord, and in the tough time of the death of my friend, I am so thankful you are right here with me, hearing, listening, and so if God is listening, what are you saying? <laughs> what are you saying to the God who listens? And then the last time we hear Jesus giving thanks. He teaches us about giving thanks in the struggles of life. Matthew 26, verse 27 then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. The scene was the night before Jesus was to be crucified. It was the, the last supper with his friends. He obviously knew of his own death. In fact, just a few moments after this, he would go to Gethsemane, and he would pray that the cup would pass from him. But on that night, he took the cup, and as he took it and held it, he gave thanks. Even in this struggle, this cup that symbolized his blood and his death, he was giving thanks for out of that painfulness comes hope. On this Veterans Day, we give thanks for our veterans. It also makes me think of those who are just beginning that journey of military service. I've had several friends just recently who've gone to boot camp. One is at Paris Island right now. Just wonder how he's doing. For there's nothing really fun about boot camp. It's hard. It's filled with struggle. But out of that struggle comes the learning necessary, the discipline necessary, for all that is to come later. And I think Jesus was understanding that out of his own struggle, out of his own boot camp, out of his own painfulness, it was necessary for all of us for what would come later. The great artist Renoir, late in his life, he, he was so crippled by arthritis he could hardly hold a paintbrush. He could hardly raise his arm to paint. A friend asked him one day, you're famous. You have a lot of great art. Why do you continue trying to painfully paint? And when Renoir said this, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. 
The pain passes, but the beauty remains. So Jesus picked up a cup on the table and gave thanks as he talked about his own death. The pain passes, but the beauty remains. And Jesus made his way to Gethsemane where he literally sweat drops of blood and he was in agonizing torture and he called out, and, Lord, let this cup pass from me. But then he finally said, not my will but thine be done. The pain passes, but the beauty remains. He was flogged within an inch of his life as he tried to stand for truth in the face of Pilate, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. He hung on a cross, and as he hung on that cross and was jeered by all of those around him, and as he reached out to draw all of us in, the pain was so great. But the pain passed, and the beauty remains. And then three days later, in this glorious miracle that we call resurrection, the one who was dead now came back to life. The pain had passed, and the beauty and the power and the glory remains to this very day. And that is our hope for the living of these days. And so we can have this mind of Christ who can, in the midst of his own struggles, say thank you to God. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Those are the right instructions. Would you pray with me about that? Oh God, sometimes life seems so hard and thanksgiving does not come easily. It seems that our tears overshadow our thankfulness and gratitude. Show us in the life of Jesus ways that we can give thanks even when we hurt. And show us that this gratitude, it can be the way that helps us move from the pain to the time when pain passes, even as it did in that glorious good news that moves from Calvary to resurrection. Oh God, move in our lives. Comfort those who are hurting. Give us all grateful hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So how will you respond to a God who gives us so much? Even in our grief, we can still be thankful because mixed in with all of life are so many gifts. Perhaps you have come to know this church as a gift, and you would like to connect your life as a member of this church and join with this loving church family. Maybe you're ready to receive the gift of new life that comes through Jesus Christ as you receive His grace and follow through baptism. Whatever decision is on your heart, we're going to sing a hymn, number 377, There is a Redeemer. I'll stand here at the front to receive you as we stand, as we sing together. Would you stand?
come now to the time where we consider how we turn gratitude into action. How we go from this place of worship and we consider how God is moving in our lives and go into the world to how we can be the hands and feet of Christ this week. So I want to turn your attention to some ways that you can be involved in what's happening here in the life of this church in the days that are coming. And so if you would, uh, direct your attention to your order of service on the back and on the inside. There are some things you'll want to know about. And as we consider this turning of gratitude into action, that is the theme of what we're discussing on Wednesday nights. So come this Wednesday at 6 o'clock and hear our own Jim Smith from the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship come and talk about uh, the ways we do that in our world and the ways uh, that that organization is doing those things. And then women, to you specifically, on Thursday night, you'll want to come and hear uh, Julie Moran speak, an evening with Julie Moran. There are still sign-ups available, and I know that Kelly is in the, in the lobby out by the Welcome Center, anxiously waiting for you to come and sign up and get your ticket and your place at the table for that happening this Thursday. And then you'll want to take notice of the thing that fell in your lap as you opened your order of worship today, and that there are two sides in case you haven't flipped it over. Uh, but to know that as Advent begins, the first weekend of December, there are ways for us to actively respond to the beginning of that season of preparation. And so throughout the weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, there's opportunity to encounter a prayer experience, encounter God through that. And that will happen in the room just behind the sanctuary that was formerly known as the Triple E classroom, the Dr. Ryland Knight Room. And the times listed, you can come and engage in prayer as we begin this time of Advent and set our hearts on that season of Christ's coming. And on that Saturday morning, we invite you to come on behalf of the engaged team to participate in some mission projects. There'll be stations set in the fellowship hall for you to come. All are welcome to come, children, adults of all ages. Uh, this is church-wide to come and participate in hands-on projects to benefit our mission partners, community members, and those we minister to and with as far as Miami and beyond. There's a way to purchase some Christmas gifts through our missions market that day and just to come and participate in some giving as we consider our gratitude as Advent begins. You'll notice the note about the Called Church Conference. And then, of course, we gather for worship on December 10th to hear the music and the sounds of Christmas as we gather in this place and also engage in lunch afterwards. And there's ways to sign up for that as well as you exit. So as we go, consider how God might move your own gratitude into action, how you might find one of these ways or others to engage in that act of service into this world. But as we go, may we stand together and offer a benediction and prayer together as we do. So stand, please. And hear these words of benediction as a call to action as we move from gratitude into this movement. And so as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and feet and work through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. In Christ our Savior we pray. Amen. Go in peace. Today I've talked with you about giving thanks even in the tough times of life. You know, it's not easy to give thanks when you have tears in your eyes. In fact, you may be in one of those tough spots right now. And with this Thanksgiving season upon us, you may be wondering, how can I give thanks with everything going on in my life? I hope that we can all learn from these lessons from the life of Jesus, who shows us how to give thanks in all circumstances, especially when life is difficult. I also know that gratitude is encouraged when we can be a part of a community of faith, when we can help one another grow in thankfulness. Do you have such a group in your life? 
If not, I would love to invite you to Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. Come worship with us. Find a Bible study group that's right for you. Let the people of this church help stir thankfulness in your heart again. I hope you can join us this next Sunday. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving season.